All right, I.J. Rosenberg here, SCORE Atlanta Studios in Roswell, uh, here with Najee Wilkins. We'll also have Craig Sager on. Second week of our shows on Peachtree Sports Network, PSN, as we like to call it. You can get PSN on Comcast. Uh, you can also get it on YouTube TV. It's also an over-the-air channel, 17.2. Uh, as well as the Atlanta News First app, which is the old CBS 46, so you can watch it on the app at any time, as well as our games on Friday night. And, of course, we're always on the National Federation High School Network. So it's Tuesday. Najee, how you doing? I'm feeling good. How about you? Good. Glad to be you here. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to Tim Scott, um, the Georgia High School Association, a new executive director. Robin Hines is not leaving. He's going to still consult. Uh, but Dr. Hines will no longer be the executive director. Tim Scott will be. And we were talking about the fact of how difficult it is to get all the officiating done, sure. not only for football, okay, but for volleyball and softball. And, you know, he was sort of telling me about how much more difficult that was or that is today than 10 years ago. You know, they're just not getting people to, you know, to become officials. Uh, football, of course, you know, struggling a little bit. Some games are having to be moved around because they can't get officials. Um, as far as volleyball and softball, it's also, you know, it's very difficult. I mean, there's hundreds of teams playing. Yeah. Hundred, you know, people forget it's not just football on Friday night. No, it's not. It's softball, like you said, it's volleyball. And then you got JV games, freshman games as well. And we've kind of seen that the Falcons were trying to help as well with the initiative that they had uh, this past year. We're just trying to get more officials to officiate games. Yeah, and I think if you want, the GHSA, you can go to GHSA dot net and there's a link on there if you're interested in becoming official because they really they really need them you know okay. they're getting more schools more games and everything like that all right well right now we always like to start off the show with fast break headlines um, i'm going to go ahead and let Najee start that all right with number one it's going to be Fowley branch taking on hart county this past week uh they uh had the game yesterday um Hart County ended up winning 35-14. to 14. They uh, jumped out to a 21-0 lead. Uh, a statement from that game, you had Chaston Lewis with a, a, a field goal block and a return for a touchdown as they jumped out to a 14-0 lead. This game was moved because of the uh, the Appalachian shooting. So Fowley Branch and Hart County played on Monday. Don't always see games like that, but uh, shout-out to Hart County for coming out with a big win, 21-0 lead, and ended up winning 35-14. All right, Pope and uh, Sprayberry are a big neighborhood rivalry, and Pope uh, beat and handed Sprayberry their first loss of the season. Pope, uh, which has struggled a little bit in football over the years, beat Sprayberry 34-23 to to open Region 6 5A play. Uh, J.T. Way delivered back-to-back -back clutch plays in the first half as Pope went on uh, to compete to complete the the victory. Um, Way's first big play was a 19-yard touchdown catch with 2.16 left in the second quarter uh, to give Pope, who's now 2-2 two and 1-0 two and and oh in the region, his first lead of the game. The second came when Way uh, recovered a Sprayberry fumble on the kickoff return. Uh, Pope took advantage of the turnover when John Sutzer rushed it in from four yards out to give the Greyhounds a double-digit lead at the break. Uh, Sprayberry, of course, their first loss, they're three and one, zero and one in the region, never seemed to fully recover from those turns of events. Pope maintained its lead throughout the second half, in route to beating the visiting Yellow Jackets. Pope coach Sean O'Sullivan, who I know pretty well, used to be over at Centennial. He says it was a complete team effort. Hats off to Sprayberry. They're a good team as well. Our kids held an explosive offense, is the best that our defenses play. Pope, you know, really good baseball school, really yeah. hasn't been known very much for football, uh, but it's good to see them get off with a, a good neighborhood win. Certainly coming off the upset, hitting Sprayberry their first loss. And then at number three, you had DJ Dallas of Brunswick, Georgia. He rattled off the first ever dynamic kickoff return for a 96-yard touchdown. He rushed for 1,599 yards and 16 touchdowns in his career at Glenn Academy. His best season came during his senior year when he rushed for 911 yards and eight touchdowns. He was rated as a three-star prospect coming out of high school, and he went on to play for the Miami Hurricanes. Uh, ended up getting drafted and played for the Seattle Seahawks before obviously coming on with the Arizona Cardinals and accomplished some history in, in the NFL. Uh, next headline, <coughs> excuse me, Mill Creek grad Jake Mahani named to the U.S. men's national team roster. Uh, Mill Creek grad earned a spot 
on the 24-25 U.S. Men's National Swim Team's roster. Uh, that was released on Monday. Magage trained locally at Swim Atlanta, was the first team All-American in the 500 free, the 400 individual medley, and the 800 free relay at this year's NCAA championship. In addition to a second team selection in a 200 butterfly, um, he was also third at the NCAAs in the 500 free, fifth in the 400 IM, and 15th in the 200 fly for the Georgia Bulldogs. So we wanna congratulate the Mill Creek grad on being named to the national team. And then at uh, number five, you have <laughs> Denmark softball. They rattled off an 11 run uh, first inning, uh, absolutely incredible to defeat South Forsyth 13-0 in Region 6, 6A action. Um, Denmark is 13-2 on the season and seven on the region. Uh, that 11 run first inning was highlighted by Grace Wilkie's three run homer and then Caitlin Jeffries three run double. Uh, they were rated as number nine team in the score Atlanta poll. Their uh, last loss was to River Ridge, which was a close one, five to four, and they have won eight consecutive games, including the victory last night against South Forsyth. All right, the last headline, Appalachia has canceled its game against Winder Barrow this week. I know that, Najee, that the school's letting the kids into, they haven't started school yet. Of course, we're talking about the shooting last week uh, up in Winder. Uh, but they are letting the kids, the kids are allowed to come back into the school to get their belongings. They haven't been able to get in, you know, because the school's been closed down uh, for police. So, you know, it's interesting to sort of see, you know, that when they're going to start school, but they have postponed the game. Um, so they won't play. And we'll continue to give you plenty of news uh, on Appalachian and what's, you know, what's going on there. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about, Najee, was this game we've got Friday night. Yes, sir which is Douglas County uh, hosting Buford. I mean, you're not going to get more prospects on the field. I haven't been able to see how Douglas County over the last four or five years has sort of grown itself. And I don't think there's any doubt that what's happened is, is they made the decision they want to have a good football team. That's why they were in Corky Town. Um, that's why we put them against Cedar Grove. But I think at the same time, what you're seeing there is Douglas is sort of, becoming a place to go to school yes. and play football. Yes. And, you know, like Nick Saban finally decided that he had seen enough of the transfers, he had seen enough of the NIL, it was just time for him to step down. Right. He just couldn't deal with all that. But I think that, you know, Najee today, if you're going to deal with it, you're going to have to understand that schools, you know, are recruiting. Yeah, I mean, they are. that's just what it comes down to. Yeah. And, you know, they're trying to do it the right way where they make the move. Uh, and then, of course, they have to go down uh, and see the GHSA and appeal it and make sure that everything is straight. But you're seeing kids change everywhere. And I'm going to bring up an example of Prince Avenue Christian in a second. But, you know, I guess it's just the way it's going to be. And, you know, we cover high school sports and, you know, you might not like it, but it's the way of the world. We might have to uh, create a new name for it as well called the high school transfer portal. I mean, you see so many guys coming in and out. And I think the key part is, you want to look at what's being said in the GHSA guidelines, right? You want to make sure you're not uh, breaking a rule when it comes to it. You make sure you're making a bona fide move. And just making sure you dot your T's, you're crossing your I's if you're going to transfer and make sure everything is worked out right. And Najee, I had breakfast this morning with Hadley Englehart, who's an NFL agent, has been an NFL agent for a long time. And we, we, we talked about a lot of different things. And he talked about the transfer portal and college and, and what that's doing to the college sport. You know, I, I think that what's interesting is to see is this going to cause a problem with the chemistry because i think that what we've seen in college football that some teams are doing better with the transfer portal than others i mean if you looked at the alabama south florida game the other day south florida was filled okay with transfers yep. okay and i think in my opinion at least um, i don't believe what's happening with Dabo sweeney and clemson where you just totally ignore the portal um, but I think at the same time, you know, it causes some problems with chemistry. My question to you on the high school level is, are these schools that are bringing kids that are replacing kids that have been there since sixth and seventh grade, you know, how, what's the reaction going to be to that? You know, how is that going to work? Yeah, I mean, to your point, and for the kids, I think it's important to say, you know, you want to have a good locker room guys, good glue guys, if you're going to bring them into the program. And for guys that's been working so hard just to get a spot, 
and they're not able to have that spot, I definitely think that that's, di that's very difficult. So when you're doing it for a coach, like let's go offensive line. Offensive line, you want to have good glue guys, right? This is the guy that's going to be protecting your quarterback, protecting your playmakers. So you don't want to just go and get a random guy and it's going to be a locker room problem. So you want to make sure that these guys you're bringing in really helps and really fits the team. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy how it's happening. I'll give you an example. Prince Avenue Christian is playing West Versailles. And we were watching the first on the first series that West Forsyth had the ball. I mean, there was a smaller kid playing cornerback, and you know he was you know he got beat pretty bad for a touchdown early in the game. And then I said to I was talking to Dave Hunter, um, who of course you know Corky is named after as well. And I said, watch what's going to happen here. And they brought in a new kid, and that kid had just arrived at Prince Avenue about a week ago from Coffee County. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he made the move, okay? But Coffee County is way in South Georgia. Yes, so is. that shows you what parents are doing there. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of times too, they want to make sure they can get their kids the right exposure because Prince Avenue Chris, two-time defending state champ, and it's like, I want to get my kid out there so you have the chance to play potentially college ball. Yeah, much different than, of course, when I was at Lakeside, and of course you were at Norcross. I mean, it's just, it's really changed. Well, we got a lot of things coming up. Uh, we've got the volleyball rankings. Uh, we're going to try some new, new things on the big screen here. And uh, as you continue to watch our show every day, we'll be testing new things. We've got a green screen, and uh, we've got a lot of bells and whistles um, that we're going to be using. But next, uh, we're going to bring in Craig Sager, and Craig's going to talk with Najee about the volleyball rankings. Georgia High School Sports Daily is brought to you by the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 613. Electrify your career. going to the actual games during the high school games during the week or are they focused on their club play in the weekends? I think the club is absolutely crucial to get on the map and that's what's great about it. A lot of these girls play together on the club teams then will go to the respective high schools 
And what's in interesting about this year, you look at Walton's new coach, he's taking over pretty much the best dynasty in the state, 15-time state champion, that's Erica Ford. She was for four years the head coach at the 8-5. So we're seeing the club go into the top program. So I think it definitely feeds off each other, but that's a huge part of it. Erica, I think, played basketball too, didn't right, she? Right, she, well, she played basketball at Georgia yep, when for Lindsay Andy was Landers, there. but she was also a great volleyball player. And I think she played more sports than it just – she was Wesleyan, correct? Is that? She went to Chattahoochee, led them to, I think, the state finals. And then she was at North Forsyth recently. She was their flag football coach. She was on the right. basketball staff. So uh, they, they're doing a really good job. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting how much money these parents come up for club because, I mean, these girls transfer everywhere. Yep. All right. Let's go to the rankings. We're going to start off with the class 6A rankings. And we're. Like I said, we're going to try some new things today. We've got, of course, our big screen behind me, uh, which you can take a look at. Uh, but, Craig, in 6A, we've got Alpharetta, number one. We've got North Society, number two. Walton is three. Marietta, four. North Cobb. And then, of course, Norcross, Buford, Brookwood, West Forsyth, and Harrison. All big schools. For sure. So, real quick, Norcross jumped the highest this week. They went from nine to six. They're on an absolute tear. And then... Uh, Harrison replaced North Paulding at 10. But what you'll notice about this 6A poll, Alpharetta, they're the defending 6A state champs. Now they're in 6A. That's the highest classification. They have only dropped two sets this entire season, 42-2 and two if you look at that, 19-0 and 0 overall record. The only teams that have taken a set on them are North Cobb and Milton. And, and I'll tell you, you know, up at that 6A, you know, we used to do television. We televised the uh, – volleyball championships a couple years this is before you got here Najee uh, but I mean it is such a fast and fun sport I think one of the cool things the difference between girls and boys sports is like in volleyball after every play they get together put their arms around each other clap and stuff like that I mean it's you know volleyball's you know very fast moving and actually very exciting to go watch all right let's drop down to 5a uh, where River Ridge is the number one ten. So we've got River Ridge, Pope, uh, Milton, Woodward Academy, Sequoia, McIntosh, Loganville, Johns Creek, Woodstock, and then Shamley. How about yep. Shamley? I haven't seen Shamley in the rankings in anything in a long time. Yeah, so Shamley got off to a 13-0 start. Then they started playing some of the, the private schools. They lost a couple, but they are back on a nice, solid win streak. They played Dunwoody tonight. That'll be a big matchup in area play. Uh, but also in the 6A poll, I want to talk – sorry, 5A. I want to talk about Milton. Last year, Milton was 19 and 24. Uh, they didn't really make any noise in the playoffs. They got beat by North Gwinnett in the first round. Now, Milton is the number five ranked team, regardless of class, in max preps. Uh, they are very competitive, and they're actually going to play North Gwinnett on Thursday. And that'll be an interesting one to see how, how much better this year's Milton team is. If they avenge that playoff loss against North Gwinnett, I'm telling you, I think they can make a run to the finals. All right, so do this. Class, we've got Alfred on top of 6A, Alfred and North Forsyth, then on top of 5A, River Ridge and Pope. If those teams played each other, the 6As against the 5As, does River Ridge and Pope have a chance at all? It would be very interesting. Pope is the team that lost to Alpharetta last year in the finals. Otherwise, they actually beat Alpharetta, I think, three times during the regular season. So I think Pope probably is the best team. River Ridge has the better record this year. Uh, but it's funny. I was thinking about last year when I watched Alpharetta win. It was almost like that feeling with Milton in football because I looked at their roster. I knew they were very young, and I was like, this team, they're going to be number one to start this season no matter what. And they're currently number 13 nationally, undefeated. So I think Pope is going to benefit from not having Alpharetta in there anymore. But River Ridge certainly has – played all this top tier yeah and I mean reclass has done a lot and of course we've talked about Milton and football mm -hmm. Milton of course going down from 6a to football he might be the best football team in yep. the state all right volleyball rankings uh, let's go to 4a pace Academy uh, is number one number two Maris uh, number two in football is Maris uh, three is Kel BT which always has very good volleyball is four st. Pius uh, number six is Midtown. Of course, Midtown used to be Grady High School uh, down across from Piedmont Park. Seven, Union Grove, uh, ELCA. Eagles Landing is number eight. Westminster, number nine, always competitive. 
and then Cartersville at number two. I do want to ask you, Craig, yes. tell us a little bit about four. I seen Pace Academy was your one, and then obviously uh, Marist was your two. Are they for real this year? Do they have a chance to make a potential run with come playoff time? It's very interesting with volleyball. Some of these teams in the polls, they've probably played 25 matches where Marist has only played about 15. So they haven't played as many games within the classification. I really like Pace Academy, though. They're ranked behind Alpharetta. They haven't lost. Uh, but Kell's a team that made a lot of noise last year in the playoffs. They just had a big win over Blessed Trinity. And then Midtown uh, is a very solid team. And then the new one that I had to put in the poll this week was Cartersville. Uh, they have definitely earned their spot in that 4A poll. Yeah, 4A is interesting, especially looking at Elka Eagles landing at number eight. All right, let's drop down to 3A. We've got Jefferson, Richmond Academy, Cherokee, Sandy Creek, Chastity, White County. Uh, from up uh, in the uh, Cleveland Helen area, Heritage, Catoosa, Oconee County, Lafayette, and Whitewater. Yep, Sandy Creek is probably a sleeper in that classification. They ended up winning it all last year. They've taken on just a brutal schedule, so they're hovering around 500. Uh, but Jefferson, I think they've earned at number one at this point. They only have one loss, and that loss came earlier to Loganville. Uh, which shot up in the poll this week. So Jefferson's just a one-loss team. See if they can win 3A. Any of the teams below five got a shot at all in 3A? 3A. Lafayette, uh, they had a big win over Northwest Whitfield this week. They're starting to heat up. So I haven't really – they haven't been on the radar until recently. Well, it's interesting because of all this reclass, there's just so many different teams and different classifications this year that you usually don't see. All right, let's go to 2A. Uh, we've got Morgan County, Pierce County, Ringgold, Columbus. By the way, I'll never forget, it's probably been about eight years ago that we did the state championships, and Columbus came in, I think they were like 3A then. They had these outside setters that were as good athletes as I've ever seen. They ended up winning a state championship. So quickly, Class 2A. Yeah, Columbus does a great job. All their girls' sports just scheduling hard and, and making noise. In 2A, Morgan County only has two losses this year, one to Hebron Christian and then one to Sandy Creek, uh, who we talked about earlier. So I think 2A, Morgan County has earned that number one spot, but it is a much different looking classification this year. All right, let's go down to Class A, and that's Gordon Lee, uh, Armucci, uh, Elite Scholars Academy. You're going to have to tell me what school that is. I haven't heard of that one. Uh, Model, Lake Oconee Academy, Fannin County, Bremen, Chattooga, Heard County, and Banks County. So Armucci moved up this week. Elite Scholars Academy is out of Jonesboro, and they've is been- a new school? Or it's renamed? pretty new. They've been in the finals, I think, probably like three or four times recently. They've been very close, but I mean, they definitely have a team that could end up winning it. They have a lot of size at the net, a, a powerful team, but definitely watch for them uh, in 2A this year. All right, let's go down to the A through 3A private school classification. We've got Hebron Christian on top, Mount Pisco, a lot of familiar names here, Greater Atlanta Christian, Levitt, Trinity Christian, Holy Innocence, Mount Perrin, St. Vincent, Savannah Christian, and Wesley. I think this one is Hebron's to lose. They're undefeated right now, I think 19-0. No. Uh, they've won state titles before, and then without having the, the pace and – Westminster's in that classification. I think they're heavy favorites. Quickly, G do you have GAC beating them, yes or no? Well, GAC was in 5A last year, and they made a, a pretty strong run. Yep. I, I would take Hebron, though. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, when we come back, we're going to talk to Kelly Poff. She's the first-time athletic director at Seconder, and uh, we'll talk to her about the way that school's doing, only second year in existence.
Yes, I'm trying. I'm not sure why it's show it's telling me that it's on. Give me one second. How's that? You don't? It's not going on. Georgia High School Sports Daily is presented by GeorgiaConstructionCareers.com. Transform your future today. And by Smart Local 85. Sheet metal is a smart move. All right, we're back at the Georgia High School Sports Daily, powered by IBW 613. IJ Rosenberg, uh, Craig Sager to my far left. And Najee Wilkins right to my left. Yes, sir. And of course, we're here every day. We've got these brand new studios here that we're very excited about. We're going to be doing different things, different shoulder programming. We're going to do a recruiting show. We're going to do a post game show after our games on Friday night. So we're real excited about that. So stick with us every day, uh, every weekday lunchtime. So you can spend lunch with us at Score Atlanta. Uh, we're on from noon until one. All right, we've got we've got Kelly Pop. All right, so I'm going to introduce the athletic director at Seconder. Is that how you pronounce it? Seconder, Seconder yes, in Gwinnett sir. County. And Kelly is an, a first time uh, AD there. Uh, used to be the softball coach. She's now in a leadership role. Seconder, by the way, is the new school in Gwinnett County. And I think probably the last school for a little while, they built so many new ones. Kelly, before we get into it, talk a little bit about your background, what you've done, what high school you went to, how you got into high school coaching, and now as the AD. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, um, thank you guys very much for having me on, and sure. it's really cool your setup. I love what you guys are doing to uh, highlight sports in Georgia, so thank you guys for doing that for sure. Um, yeah, so my background, I, I was a 14-year a teacher and head softball coach uh, prior to moving into um, athletic director role at a new high school and uh it was like it was an honor to be able to open a new high school in Gwinnett um and like you said hopefully the last one for a while uh here in Gwinnett because such a big county but yeah my background has always been a been a head coach Kelly let me ask you this there's no one busier at the school than the athletics director especially a, a school of your size I mean you know the focus sometimes I think in Georgia gets to be so pro football and so much football. And now, of course, we've got flag football for the girls, which is great. But you're responsible for all the sports programs. you got to make sure the buses are there. you got to make sure they've got officials. I mean, it's just one thing. So give me a typical day for you as AD at Second Year. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had, like, a, an actual true answer to that. But what I've learned quickly is that, you know, you can plan as much as you want, but – you walk into school and as an assistant principal in Gwinnett, you know, we're, we're assistant principals and athletic directors. And so 
I have an alphabet that I'm uh, responsible for. For that, that's my cohort to make sure they're good with discipline and that they graduate. Um, and so I have that going on at the same time. Con- at the same time, I'm working with um, athletics. But you know, I'm, I'm blessed to have an amazing athletic clerk who really truly does help me uh, manage my days and the time to make sure that we are fully supporting our coaches and our programs uh, to do things like making sure our buses are always scheduled, uh, that we're inputting changes when necessary, things like that. So the day the day to day looks different, but at the end of the day, the the impact, the opportunity for impact with the, with the kids and the athletes and and the coaches is really what it's all about. So I guess that's that's really what we try to focus on. Now, Kelly, I know Seconder got a lot of kids from Mill Creek, correct? A lot of a lot of your kids. Yes, sir. From Mill, a lot of people don't understand Mill Creek was the largest high school. And despite that, how many kids do you think y'all pulled from that? I don't know. Maybe like 800, 900. We, we pulled a lot from Mountain View as well. So we're kind of stuck in between like Mountain View, Mill Creek, and Buford. But Mill Creek's still the biggest, you know, what's incredible is Mill Creek is still the biggest school in the state. But let's talk about the football team. Team is 3-0. and uh, Like I said, brand new school. I mean, that is really, really impressive. Yeah, I mean, they've done an outstanding job. And, you know, I was thinking about when I was thinking about, you know, speaking with you guys today and I was thinking about our football program or, or any of our programs, honestly, that they really are having a lot of success right now. You know, our softball team is currently ranked number one in the state. Um, and so when I when I start thinking about those things, obviously we have great humans. And that's the truth. Like we, we have great humans who come every day to, to pour into these kids to try to develop them as people first. And they do that at a high level. And that translates, obviously, into what they're doing on the field or on the court. And so very grateful for that and the investment that our coaches are putting in, for sure. But football is a different beast, and you guys know that. So – um, it's been really cool to see these kids who, as ninth graders, were having to line up across from juniors and seniors in a football game, and they've had that experience now. And so those freshmen are now juniors in our third year, and I think they're starting to build confidence and feel like they belong, and they play really hard for, for each other and, and for second year. Now, you and the head coach, uh, the football team, Coach Lati, you know, if y'all sort of cross paths early in y'all's coaching career, what made you think of him? as far as hiring him as the first football coach at Seconder? Well, um, he was actually our second coach. Um, We had a different coach year one, and then um, year two, Coach Lottie came in, and, you know, for me anyways, you're right, we did cross paths. So I was a head softball coach, and he was a coordinator at a high school. And my nephew actually. that? So that was at Woodland High School in Stockbridge. So I was there for seven years, and Coach Lottie was there, and my nephew played football for him. And so um, just really knowing him as a person, his character and the way he builds his programs and the kind of staff he puts around himself, I knew that at a new school, really needing to try to build a, a solid foundation was important. Let's move to softball, uh, uh, Ms. Poff, and talk a little bit about their team. You said the number one ranked, obviously, you know, they've scored 155 runs this year. Just talk a little about them, why they've had so much success this year, and they're one of the best teams in the state. Yeah, I mean, Coach Crawford does an outstanding job. Um, Again, he's a great person first, but he has a great coaching staff, and his kids have really bought into the culture that he's trying to establish within that program. Um, And, you know, right now that they're offensively just been incredible, and, you know, they've broken two all-time going at county records this year already, which is pretty impressive. We have an individual that has 10 RBIs in a game. That was a – that set a record, and then our team had five home runs in one game. So um, they're doing great, great things, but besides all of that, the most impressive thing to me about that team is is how hard they play for each other, um, and that's always what they're focused on, and that's pretty that's pretty cool to see. And coach, we were talking about volleyball earlier. Um, I'm curious, what's the youth or experience kind of like on this year's team? They're ten and seven. They're having success. How young is this team, and where do you see them progressing? Yeah, they, this team is very young. Um, I think she has like four freshmen to start. Um, so to have that, you know, at this level, as you know, is um, is very rare, but they're super talented. So it's going to be, they're a fun team to watch, really high energy. She got a lot of big girls that are, that are very good. And so um, I think it's going to be neat to see if they, if they mesh at the right time and hit that groove at the right time, rolling into the playoffs, they could make some noise. They're, they're pretty talented for sure. And Coach D does an outstanding job with that program and the feeder program. She's going to be good for a while. Kelly, let me ask you this. One of the things that we talked about earlier on the show was there's a lot of kids that are transferring. 
you know, they're, they're finding places that work for them. And that's changed a lot over the last four or five years. And I think a lot of it is being pushed down by what's happening at college and the transfer portal and everything. As the athletic director, you have to make sure that if a kid comes to your school, that they're doing it the right way. Take us through that process or the process you've sort of put in for that. Yeah, I mean, my athletic clerk and I, we, we sit down, we, we meet with families as they come in to ensure that we're following all the processes correctly. Uh, we're very transparent with families and, as they come in and our coaches, because um, it's important that not only we do the process correct, but that when they get here, that they understand this is what our expectations are. And we, we call it the secondary standard. And it's important to us that kids and families buy into that and, and that they carry themselves the right way and represent our school in a positive way. Yeah, and, you know, it's and that's not easy for you. I mean, because you've got to make sure it's done correctly, because if it's not done correctly and they end up playing, you know, and you end up getting caught for it, I mean, you end up having to forfeit games. That's correct. Well, listen, Kelly, we appreciate it. Uh, you know, you've done a fabulous job. We're a big fan of all the schools in Gwinnett. But thanks for coming on. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you, guys. It was really nice. I appreciate it. Thank you again for what you're doing. All right, real quick, we've got the Georgia High School Football Daily, Mr. Georgia football watch list coming up. The Mechanical Trades Institute is an opportunity towards personal financial freedom through hands-on and rewarding work. Our school is completely free and gives apprentices the knowledge and skills required to gain access to a lifelong career path. Apprentices learn pipe fitting, plumbing, mechanical service, and welding. They earn money as they learn and graduate with no student debt. Start a career with the Mechanical Trades Institute and change your financial future. All right, I.J. Rosenberg, Najee Wilkins, Craig Sager. This is the Georgia High School Sports Daily, powered every day by IBW 613, Monday through Friday. We are on from noon to 1. And before we get to the Georgia High School Football Daily information, I'll, I'll tell you what, and Craig, you're in here now. I'm really excited about Friday night. I mean, I just, you know, we've done hundreds of football games and a lot of big ones. Uh, but the one Friday night, I think, is, you know, as far as the talent on the field is as big as any we'll probably end up doing. It's hard to replicate when you yeah. look at that. It's, and a, it's, it's a semifinal or it could be a state oh, championship. Yeah, for That's sure. a great point. For sure. And I think there's questions for both of them, but they're coming off massive wins. You can't uh, undercount Buford, how they responded early in their season. That big win over Roswell is definitely impressive. And then Douglas County, the way they're running the ball, going up against this Buford defense. As I said, I think it's going to be the most physical game we have televised so far. All right, our partner, of course, is the Georgia High School Football Daily Newsletter. 24,000 people read that every morning. Todd Holcomb, Chip Say, Ted Langford do a fabulous job with that every morning. Um, and you can also check out the daily. There's a couple different ways. You can scan the QR code uh, that we have on right now, or you can just go to the website, Georgia High School Football Daily and you can sign up the newsletter 
uh, is free. So a couple of things they had this morning. They named their state player of the week. It was Skylar Williams, big quarterback, 6'2", 215 for Warner Robins. Of course, Warner had the big upset, 55-44 uh, over Houston County, threw for 150 yards. Uh, he actually ran, I think, for 150 yards, just had a, just a tremendous, tremendous day, broke a lot of tackles, uh, and really was the big reason, I think, the difference in the game over Houston County. Yes, he was. He was certainly big. And then at number two, a lot of top performers, obviously you had Elijah Hayes of West Hall. He scored eight touchdowns versus Johnson. Uh, and also you had Jefferson's Rhett Hemphill scored three touchdowns. He made my top performance on scoreatlanta.com. You guys can go check that out. But he had three touchdowns, an interception, and he also had a recovered fumble, 45-28 uh, against Stevens County. Outstanding performance. And then finally, uh, Todd mentioned it yesterday. There's 30 inductees this year's class. Uh, he started unveiling the bios th today. It was Frank Broyles. He is one of the inductees that not only was an outstanding player, was a great coach as well, dabbled in the media also. He was a three-sport star at Decatur High School, could have potentially played in the NFL or NBA, but went into coaching after his playing career and had great success. So he's got connections to Arkansas, Georgia Tech, and like Jeff Bauer, High School. Yeah, was an incredible three-sport athlete. Did well, you get a chance to see him play? What? Did you get a chance to see him play? No. <laughs> <laughs> I did, though, however. He was really, you know, we talk about, you know, these different people like Tony Romo and, of course, Matt Ryan and different analysts in the booth. But Frank was really the first for ABC, was the first analyst that really dove deep. I mean, he was sort of like the, the early years of John Madden. Mm. I mean, he was that good. And there was just something about his southernness, you know, coming from Atlanta. And, of course, you go to Arkansas, they change it for sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, was a great coach over there. Uh, but don't forget to check out every morning the headlines. Like I said, you can go to GHSA or the actual Georgia High School Football Daily website and you can get their newsletter 24,000 people every day and like I said they do just a fabulous job all right let's go to our something new that score Atlanta will be doing this year that'll be on December 8th at the Teamsters event facility uh, down in South Atlanta we will award in addition to a lot of awards we'll award our Mr. and Mrs. football um, flag football doesn't start for a couple more weeks and we've got the Corky Kell, Dave Hunter uh, flag games, four games on TV coming up. Um, but now we're doing Mr. Football, and it's really never been done in Georgia. So we have a watch list, and we're talking about this every Tuesday. And, uh, Nadja, I'm going to let you start off. Yes, sir. Uh, with the, the big quarterback at Houston County who's on our watch list, Antoine Hill. Yeah, so Antoine Hill went 25-42, 270 yards and four touchdowns, each to a different receiver. Uh, he was phenomenal. He did end up losing, obviously, to Warner Robins, 54-44, to but he had a stellar performance uh, on Friday night. And then at number two, Laganza here at Toombs County, they pulled off a major upset, 28-point underdog. They were able to beat uh, Rome, 33-29. to He had five catches for 90 yards and a touchdown. Outstanding performance for him. And then at number three, you had Savannah Christians, Elijah Griffin. He had three tackles for loss in this one, two sacks, and also a forced fumble. Him and LaDamian Geithner, some of the best defensive linemen we have in uh, the state of Georgia. They've been incredible so far. And then number four, you had Wesleyan quarterback Ben Brown. Very underrated player for them, um, but he had 287 yards passing. He only had two incompletions, just two, five touchdowns to five different receivers. He's been tearing it up, and he's been absolutely stellar for Wesleyan. And then last one for me, Valdosta quarterback Todd Robinson. We've got to get South Georgia some love. We know we have our South Georgia spotlight um, every single week. He was 19 of 25 for 158 yards and two touchdowns. He also rushed for 127 yards and two touchdowns. Valdosta, IJ, they are 4-0 and to start the season. They have been incredible so far. They have. And yep. it's good to see. It's scored. But I'm, let's, go back to, let's go back to the Griffin kid from Savannah Christian for a second. What a, I mean, he's a man. I mean, he really is. I mean, you just watch him. And first of all, he's playing for a small school. All right? We're going to get a chance to show people him. When they play BT coming up in a few weeks, weeks. Yep. we're going to have to. But best player in the state? Yeah. 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 I mean, with, with so much talent, the fact that he's able to stand out from that group, it's, it's pretty impressive. And that defense is no joke. Yeah, I mean, and uh, look, I'll tell you what, he's, uh, you know, he's going to be a tremendous player at the next level. And I think we'll be watching him on 
Sundays coming in a few years. All right, Craig, can you finish up yep, the watch let's list Yep, let's go to Juju Lewis. He had six touchdown passes in this most recent win, five touchdowns in the first quarter, and all of them in the first half, 12 of 14. He has 18 touchdowns so far. They're undefeated. He's getting everyone involved. Uh, not Maybe not as explosive as last year with Caleb Odom, but the, the passing attack's been great. And think about that. Kamari Farmer is getting not a lot of carries, so he still is going to be uh, ready to go if they need to run the ball. Uh, let's go to our next one, though. It's going to be Cedar Town's Tay Harris. He's already surpassed his total touchdowns from last year. And I think with Tay Harris and a lot of guys on these watch lists, their teams are massively improved um, at this point in the season opposed to last year. And Cedartown has some big games coming up. They're going to be playing Cartersville in region play. When you have a player that's playing in all the different phases, he also has a big fumble recovery this touch, or sorry, this season. I think if he continues to help spark that Cedartown team, he could climb in this uh, watch list. Uh, the next guy, Camden County, is Elias Williams, the tight end. He also has already surpassed his receiving totals from last year. He's being used way more, and I guess similar to Juju, he's doing it all in the first half. Um, last week, Juju, six touchdowns the first half. Who knows how many he could have gone off for. Same thing with Elias. He had two touchdowns this last game, uh, second multi-touchdown game of the season, and he's been absolutely unstoppable. Um, my next one, North Oconee's Landon Rolden, first time he's been on this list, but his five touchdown performance was such a big deal last week. Uh, they won 36 to 13. He scored every single one of their touchdowns. He had the two rushing scores, the three through the air, and also forced a fumble on defense. And then finally, Justice Terry, he helped Manchester with a 42-6 win over Macon County. The Blue Devils are averaging just 7.3 points per game that they're giving up. And Upson Lee was a team that had a big win over Spalding. Manchester shut them out. Before we go to IJ, I do want to ask you, Craig, do you feel like there's a player, you just mentioned London Rolden, do you feel like there's a player that's trending upwards in this Mr. Georgia football watch that we should pay a little bit more attention to? I think it's him. Uh, that performance he had last week, and North Dakota is a team that I think can win it all this year. If he's able to have that, that big-time performance lead them, um, as that Lad McConkey type player, we saw how many numbers he put up. I think he's a guy that can definitely um, be one of those final five. Well, I'll tell you what, what's incredible, guys, is just the talent in the state. I mean, we've got 10 players here. There's another 100 um, that could certainly uh, be on the list. All right, coming up, we've got uh, our lap, uh, what we call the lap, uh, when we sort of take a look around all the sports. Uh, and don't forget about Friday night, our big game, at Douglas County, right here on PSN, Buford at Douglas County. All right, which ones do you guys want on this? Can you clip that? The one we just did, post it. Hey, tag the players. Are we all right, Lone Graphic, or no? Appreciate you, brother. Okay, so I'm going to get number one. Najee, you get number two. Craig, three. And then Najee back to four. Okay. Wait, hold up. Say that one more time. Okay, so I'm going to get one. Najee, two. You, three. Najee, four. You, five. Can okay. I take two? Take two. That's really his story. Okay, that's fine. I could do it. All right, Craig. And then we'll go to Najee on eSports. Is sure. that all right? Yes, sir. No problem. Okay, and then how about four flag football? I can do that can one. Can you do that I one? I got you. Okay, and then Craig on the Paralympics. Okay. Four. okay. Adaptive, right? Adapted. Yeah, that'd be great. So it's adapted sports. Mike Phillips, okay. You want that one? Yeah, I'll take that one. Okay. All right, I'll take the two. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll be calling good time. Yeah. That'll be good. Kendall White on the volleyball. She's committed to St. John's University, if you don't know. Right there, St. John's. St. John's? Yes, St. John's University. Is that better? Yeah. St. John's? Correct. And she, yeah, she is a St. John's. <coughs> All right, welcome back to Georgia High School Sports Daily, powered by IBW Local 613. Before we, go, before we take our lap to close out the show, region play is starting. I mean, you know, now the games are starting to count. I mean, most everybody by this week will be in region play. And, of course, that's when it makes it interesting because, you know, now they've got the new power rankings at the lower classifications, so a lot of things count. Uh, at the upper classifications, of course, everybody's jockeying for seeding and stuff like that. I mean, is there, you know, any, and we'll, we'll go over the regions and stuff as we go on, uh, but there's some, there's some difficult regions out there, especially in Gwinnett County. I think the Gwinnett County one I want to mention really quickly is Buford, Collins Hill, Mill Creek. Collins Hill is 4-0 so far this where, season. Where, Najee, where, where did Collins Hill come from? Uh, hey, they're a sleeper. That, yeah. that I mean, Coach Swick is good. They won a state championship a couple what, years four ago. years ago. Beat yeah. Grayson to open the season. I'm telling you, it's that defense. Is it? It's yeah. the defense. Yeah. yeah Coach over there. Coach over there has done a great job. All right. Every uh, Tuesday at this time, last segment, we do what's called the lap. We sort of take a look at what's going on in all the sports in high school. We'll start off with Norcross Volleyball. Uh, they were really good at the North Cobb Classic. Uh, the team won three of its four matches Saturday. Uh, the Blue Devils claim victories over Eagles Landing, Christian, West Forsyth, and Woodstock. Uh, they ended up losing to a very good Maris team, but played extremely well. Uh, Norcross is now the volleyball team 15-3. and three. They got stellar play from Kendall White, who, by the way, uh, has uh, committed to St. John's University. She had 43 kills and 18 digs. Uh, Genesis Smith, another great uh Great weekend, 28 kills, 7 blocks. Sophie Guerrero Wilson had 35 kills. Ellie Ruth Blue, 108 assists, 15 digs. Grayson Taylor had 30 digs. And so Zoe Felder had 10 kills. So really good North Cobb Classic for Norcross Volleyball. All right, we'll stick to volleyball. Shambly senior Nathalie Sai, she hit the 2,000 kill, uh, 500 assist career mark earlier last month. Shambly's a team we talked about. They are back in the top 10 this week. They've made three straight Sweet 16 uh, appearances, and she is climbing up the charts on the all-time uh, stat leaders for DeKalb County. She's a player to watch. She's uh, committed to the University of Pennsylvania. She's going to the Ivy League. And then at obviously number three, you have eSports officially beginning this week. The preseason is going to start. If you don't know what eSports stands for, it stands for electronic sports. It's not just video games, so don't be confused with that. It takes video games to another level with organized competitive gameplay between two teams governed by its own strict set of rules and guidelines. The difference is comparable to a pickup game of basketball at a park versus a varsity high school basketball game. Esports requires teamwork, communication, critical and strategic thinking, creativity, sportsmanship, and leadership, much like traditional sports. So that is starting up here pretty soon. Did you did you cover the state championships last year for esports? I did not. Yeah, I I'll have not. to find out who. We'll have to have them on because it's. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean how that sports now and it's growing yeah all right now we got girls flag football girls flag football and if you guys don't know it is starting up here pretty soon we're going to air some games on the corky hill dave hunter flag football classic october 2nd at blessed trinity uh so far you don't mind if i feel the matches do you no okay you got, got greenbrier versus alatoona 
Uh, that's going to be at 530. Loganville versus Blessed Trinity, 630 p.m. North Oconee versus Lithia Springs at 730 p.m. And then McKeetron versus West Forsyth at 830. At 830, excuse me. It's a very evolving sport. As uh, I alluded to earlier in the show, we're going to have a Miss Georgia flag football as well. So it's going to be so fun covering the sport. We're going to have rankings as well on scoreatl.com. So you can check all that out there. And uh, a very and fun Nodge, sport. Nodge, we had our first seven on seven, Corky Kell, Dave Hunter. We did it at West Forsyth. And I'm going to tell you something. There's some real talent out there. Yes, I mean, McKeetron ended up winning it. Uh, but every team out there was competitive. What's really cool for me for flag football and, of course, I had two daughters that played sports, you know, and I wish we would have had flag football back then. But I think the growth of it just shows you how popular football is. It doesn't make any difference whether seven-year-olds are playing it or NFL. It's just, I mean, it's it, and it's growing so quickly. Yes, it is. All across the southeast, is, is, it's going out more so to California as well. It's everywhere. Yeah, yeah but that was honestly, that was the highlight of media day. Uh, for myself, probably Najee included, just hearing the girls talk about it, picking up the sport, and then the buildup for this season specifically, now that they have experience, they kind of know the teams that have stood apart. And I'm just going to say it, don't sleep on McEachern this year. They Ooh. won our 7-on-7. Seven seven. They got a heck of a quarterback, and they look like the team to beat. And that quarterback, really quickly, guys, is Chelsea Njoku. So we'll look out for her. She ended up having a great game and ended up winning, obviously, our 7-on-7 seven seven invitation. And we'll also have the girls at the Elite Classic. We'll have a senior game and an underclassman game. All right, the lap ends with the 2024 Paralympic athletes bring seven medals back to the Peach State. Seven of the 105 Paralympic medals were won by five Georgia athletes who represented the Peach State. It's track and field runners Ryan Bedrano, Jared Wallace, and Jared Wallace, swimmers Mackenzie Cohen and Gia Pergolini, and wheelchair basketball player Bailey Moody. Team USA sends about 225 athletes from 39 states to the Paralympic Games. Six Paralympians from Georgia, which means all but one homegrown athlete medaled uh, this year. We're also adaptive sports. We're going to have an interview with Mike Phillips next week. And let me tell you something, and we showed this at Corky Kell. This is important to us, okay? You know, if, we, if people got the opportunity to watch Corky Kell at the coin flip, we had big Down syndrome groups coming out. That's important to us. It's important for us to focus on these athletes. And if you ever get a chance to watch them, I mean, they're pretty incredible. 100% agree. I mean, it's a fun sport. And like you said, it's just create opportunities for them just to be highlighted and give them that exposure, you know, that they wouldn't otherwise get. Yeah, and let us know. I mean, if you all have something, a story, something like that, go to our website. You can absolutely give us a call, send us an email. We'll take a look at it and possibly – Put them on the show. All right, coming up real quick, Friday night, we got the big game, Buford at Douglas County, 8 o'clock kickoff. But we will be back tomorrow with the show like we'll be back every day, Monday through Friday at noon. Basic combat.